Hello, everyone. My name is Sue Washer, President and CEO of AGTC, and I'm delighted to be here at the meeting on the Med. These are our forward-looking statements for Applied Genetic Technologies as a publicly traded company. And this is an overview of our company, kind of the, the core uh, impetus of moving the company forward. And that is, is that we believe we have a firm foundation in science and manufacturing that has allowed us to develop best in class late stage data for XLRP, as well as our recently announced exciting data in achromatopsia, both of which are orphan ophthalmology indications. A moment to, to speak about manufacturing, something that is very important in the gene therapy space. Our manufacturing system is already at commercial scale. There is no forward process development, no forward scale up that we need to do to meet commercial levels. One thing we feel is very important in the gene therapy space that I know most people in this audience are aware of is that gene therapy is a complex modality and that each component of your gene therapy vector must be customized to the specific indication you're working on, whether that's the capsid, the exterior of your vector that will get into the cell type of interest to you, the promoter that will drive the right amount of expression in that cell type, or the gene cassette that will make sure that your expressed protein uh, is therapeutic for the patient. All of these elements need to be customized specifically for the patient population of interest. And importantly, in ophthalmology, which the programs I'm gonna be talking about today are in, you have to do this screening and customization in non-human primates because the specificity of the capsid and the promoter are not maintained in the eye across species. And this is something that we work on very hard and we think it's really the hallmark of our company and how carefully we design our vectors. This is our product pipeline. Uh, today I'm gonna concentrate on XLRP, X-linked retinitis pigmentosa, an inherited retinal disease, and achromatopsia, another inherited retinal disease. Both of these programs are in the clinic and we have recently reported updated data on these programs. But we also have a rich pipeline within the ocular space. We have some preclinical programs in neurodegenerative diseases, and we also have a partnership with Autonomy on an otology indication, a hearing loss indication uh, that is moving forward towards the clinic. So a very diverse pipeline uh, behind these later stage assets. The first product I'm gonna talk about is our product candidate for X-linked retinitis pigmentosa. This is actually a fairly large segment of the inherited retinal diseases, about 20,000 patients in the US and EU, and it's a very devastating disease in that it's uh, uh, diagnosed fairly early um, in these young boys' life around the age of uh, six or seven. And when they get this diagnosis, they know that every day for the rest of their life, they're gonna lose more and more vision. They're legally blind by the age of 45, and usually in their 56, 50s and 60s, they lose all vision completely. So this is an example, I'm using XLRP as an example of how we applied that science and technology I talked about before and that very careful screening of the product components. So we're using an engineered vector, an engineered capsid in this program, and it has been shown in non-human primates to have about twice the expression levels of other commonly used capsid, which is very important because you can do reasonable dosing and, and really control any side effects of the program, of the pro of the protein. And then we also selected a promoter that looks at that and expression in both rods and cones. And we have a codon optimized gene. And we were the only group that worked with the naturally occurring large animal model, which is in two different breeds of dogs at the University of Pennsylvania. And this allowed us to do some very careful checking that this codon optimized gene was expressing the full length wild type uh, protein and that it was fully active. So this is the careful science that underlined our clinical program. 
The first data that we reported um, mid last year was that in two of our dose groups, in gr what we call dose groups two and four, we had a 50% response rate. So we had 50% of those patients in those two groups uh, that had a positive increase in visual sensitivity, the ability of the retina to sense light. And we were able to show that over a t full 12 month period, those treated patients, uh, the treated eyes in red, maintained that improvement in visual sensitivity, while the untreated eyes uh, had no change in their visual sensitivity. And this is very important to show the durability of the, of, of the improvement. And this was a meaningful improvement to those patients as reported in their anecdotal comments. When we interacted with the FDA as part of our end of phase two discussion, the FDA requested us to do a pointwise analysis of visual sensitivity. It's the exact same data. It's the same machine. It's a Maya micropermitter that's used to calculate that mean sensitivity I showed earlier. But in this case, you're just looking at each of the individual points that the Maya uh, analyzes and assigning it either it responded in green or it declined in red. And what this shows is examples of three patients where you can see that very a, a large number of points actually improved. Uh, the FDA would consider a responder a patient who has at least five loci, five points that improve by at least seven decibels. And that's what these green dots uh, show. So when we did that analysis uh, late last year on a group, on that original group of patients that were out to 12 months, and then on higher dose group patients that were out to six months, what we saw is in the lower dose group patients, we had about a 28% response rate. And then the high dose patients, we had about a 62% response rate. Once we uh, discounted the patients that would not meet our inclusion exclusion criteria going forward. An important aspect of our data set is that we are unusual uh, amongst our peers in that we're also seeing in the data that our patients are seeing improved or, so, or stable visual acuity over time. This shows all 20 across both the early dose groups and the later dose group patients that were dosed centrally. And you can see in the treated eye, the visual acuity is being maintained or improved while the untreated eye is either going down or, or not doing well over time. And, and this is uh, unique data to us. We think it's very supportive of the statistically significant data we're seeing in visual sensitivity. So based on this data, we are now moving forward into a phase two, three trial. It's called our VISTA trial. And this trial was designed after consultation with the FDA. It has two masked groups um, in a lower dose group, group two, and a higher dose group, group five, uh, with about 20 patients in each with a single eye dose, and then a fully untreated control, again, of 20 patients uh, that will cross over at the 12 month time point. We will be using the endpoint of visual sensitivity defined as a responder rate uh, with that seven decibels at at least five loci. Uh, and we will also be including visual acuity as a supportive endpoint and the visual navigation challenge uh, from Aura as a mobility maze to really help us tie that quantitative visual sensitivity data to something that can be more easily uh, and readily interpreted by patients as an easier way to get through the maze and then tie that to the patient reported outcomes and we're using a new validated PRO survey for this trial. Importantly, we're also going to have a six-month IA, so we're going to keep that masked at that point. We're going to be able to make sure that our statistical plan is holding up and we'll have the um, possibility of adjusting the number of patients in the arms, potentially of working with the FDA and being able to dose the second eye earlier. It's really just a good interim point so that we don't get all the way to 12 months and, and, and have missed our statistical uh, power by just a little bit. So for XLRP, we're really set up for success over the next two years. We do believe that that scientific expertise set us up for clinical success. We've got this improved manufacturing process. No further changes needed to be made in either the analytics or the process or the scale going forward. And there are four 
data points coming up over the next two years. We've got 12 month data for the high dose groups in the second quarter. We've got three month data for the new Skyline expansion trial um, in the fourth quarter. And then in 2022, we'll have that six month interim analysis for the phase two, three VISTA trial, as well as 12 month data for the Skyline trial. Now I'm gonna move on to talk very briefly about achromatopsia. This is another inherited retinal disease, another fairly substantial patient population of about 27,000 patients in the US and EU, but it's a very, very different clinical phenotype. Uh, these patients have the phenotype and have the symptoms of the disease from birth, and it's not degenerative. It stays stable over time. Uh, they have very poor vision. They're legally blind, extremely light sensitive, and a complete loss of color discrimination. They only see in black and white and shades of gray because while they have cones, their cones are not functioning because of some mutated genes that they possess that cause the indication. And we've been working on this indication for a number of years. Once again, we're the only group that worked with naturally occurring large animal models, and we think that set us up for success. We've, over the last course of 2020, we were able to report that the product was extremely well tolerated, which means that across both of our achromatopsia and XLR P trials, which use the same capsid, uh, we now have a, a large number of patients that have experienced no adverse events related to the product um, and have had a very good profile, well, profile when it comes to inflammation. They've seen no secondary inflammation. And across XLRP, this is a 100-fold dose range. Across the chromatopsia, it's an 80-fold dose range. We did see some uh, encouraging signs of biological activity that we reported in 2020, uh, but earlier this year, we were able to report that when we did a deep dive on the static perimetry, uh, we were able to see about a 50% of the patients that we had looked at to date, that we've uh, dosed to date, have had a positive response in static perimetry for B3, and in the A3 trial, which is another a gene that causes a chromatopsia, exact same phenotype, uh, it's a slightly lesser uh, percentage. But in both cases, it was at the higher doses, as we previously stated, that achromatopsia may need higher doses and longer time frames. Uh, and this static perimetry data gave us the first indications that that, that was the case. I'm going to look at one example of a patient from this trial that showed this uh, very significant response. This happens to be a 53-year-old patient in the next to highest dose in this trial. And on the far left-hand side, you can see that the untreated eye does not change over time in gray, whereas the treated eye has as much as a 10 decibel improvement in sensitivity. And this is quite uh, remarkable, and the patient certainly noticed the effect. And when you look at it, uh, the sensitivity as a heat map, you can see that, that br those brighter colors at month 12 are focused right where we put the product in the subretinal bleb. So this gives us confidence that the product is really changing, uh, causing this change in sensitivity. Importantly, in this patient, we also have very good outcomes on a uh, multifocal ERG, which is just electrical signaling, so the patient really can't bias this endpoint. Uh, and what you can see is, again, in the area where the subretinal bleb was placed, that there are improvements in the multifocal ERG, which says that the cones are signaling uh, to other cells in the area. When you look at this patient over time, you can see that the untreated eye in the bottom, there's virtually no change in visual sensitivity over time in this 3D interpretation. But in the treated eye on the top, you can see that by month three, the colors are getting much brighter, and that is maintained all the way through to 12 months. So we're quite excited about this data. We're going to be quite focused on the uh, multifocal ERG as well as the static perimetry. And in the uh, second uh, quarter of this year, we'll have full 12 month data for all adult patients in the trial. And in the third uh, quarter, in the fourth quarter of the year, we'll have three month data from new pediatric patients that we're dosing. We are now dosing patients as young as four years of age. We've added a couple of interesting endpoints here. Uh, one is uh, 
F fun functional MRI imaging, which will be able to uh, look at the visual cortex and will actually be able to image whether the signaling from the cone photoreceptors is getting back to the brain and being processed. Uh, and then we're also adding a novel color brightness test so we can better quantify the reported changes from the patients in their color perception. So as I said, lots of exciting things happening at, AR, at AGTC for our, our top two programs in X-linked retinitis stigmatosa and achromatopsia. Uh, two data readouts for achromatopsia in, in, for XLRP in 2021 and two more in 2022, and then two treat, data readouts for achromatopsia in uh, 2021. So lots of exciting things happening at AGTC. Uh, we look forward to talking to you throughout the meeting.